It's Friday, December 14th, Saturday, December 15th. If you're on the East Coast or across the pond, and this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you had a great day and night. I am your host, Dave Scott, broadcasting to you live from the Great White North on top of the mountains of central British Columbia, right here at SOR headquarters. We are taking you into the weekend on the SOR Radio Network and Deep Talk Radio. Remember, all of our archives are free for you at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you. Rock out to Bumblefoot. Soon shop at our store. Read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by the YouTube channel in Suho. Sebastian Martin brings high-quality messages to the masses. Go to our website, click on the Insuho banner, and subscribe today. Across the United States and Canada, and almost every country in the world, there are fables and legends that seem to haunt cities and towns, which become a big part of their local history. Most of the time, these stories stay within the community itself. Other times, the stories are so lifelike that it seems everyone has heard about it even just once. That's no exception for a small rural town in Tennessee. Researcher and folklorist Pat Fitzhugh is here tonight to tell us all about the mysterious hauntings and the tormented pioneer family on Tennessee's early frontier between 1817 and 1821, as we now know it as the Bell Witch, or what is known as as America's greatest ghost story. Then at the bottom of hour number three, we've given Olaf Phillips from Paranoia Magazine the night off. I will be reading the news in the SOR Newswire. Pat Fitzhugh, it's been a long time since we've had you back on Spaced Out Radio, but my friend, always a pleasure to have you on the show. How you been? Hey, Dave. Hey, great to be back. It has been a long time, and I really enjoyed it. I think it was back in 2015 or so, and, oh, we had a great time. We covered a lot of ground, got a lot of discussion taken care of, and I'm, I'm doing just great tonight. Just thrilled to be here. Yeah, we're good heading into the weekend with a good topic like this because you are such a great storyteller, Pat, that I think our audience is in for a real treat if they've never heard about the Bell Witch. And, you know, I always like our audience to get to know our guests first and foremost. How did you get involved with this paranormal story? What intrigued you about it? Well, that story was first told to me when I was a child uh, by my mother. And I thought it was, you know, pretty interesting, especially the hocus pocus aspect of it and all the thrills and everything. But as I grew a little bit older, you know, I, I, I began to question how could all of this, or even some of this, for that matter, be true? So, you know, I assumed that it probably wasn't true. But then I began doing a little bit of research. I figured, you know, doing a little bit of research in the case, I would very easily determine whether it was true or not or how much of it was true. Uh, and also during that period, my mother explained to me that we are related indirectly to the Bells several generations back. And she, in fact, grew up just a few miles from ground zero of where all of this took place or allegedly took place. And, you know, as I researched more and more, it seemed that every answer I found yielded 10 or 20 more questions. And what I thought was going to be a short you know, research project I could do every day after school for a little while and maybe on some Saturdays uh, turned out as of now to be an exactly a 40 year research project. And, you know, it's like a lot of research. You go, go for a while, you don't find anything, you get discouraged. Then all of a sudden you find something that's credible and you can piece it with something else. And it's just a very long process going through a big maze, trying to separate the fact from fiction. And as you know, you know, with any story, especially something that's so hard to believe with all the things happening, that the story grows over time as generations tell the story over and over, each time a little different and sometimes even adding or embellishing things, which that makes it harder for the researcher. But, you know, hey, that's just me. I love a good challenge. 
So I guess what really intrigued me the most about the story is that unlike a lot of legends and ghost stories you hear, the Bell Witch is a story where you can actually validate at least the people involved as well as the places where these different incidents allegedly occurred. You know, with most ghost stories and things you hear today, even if a name of somebody is even mentioned or a place, you can usually try to look it up and you don't find anything. But with the Bell Witch, these people were all real. Um, I've read all about them, researched all about these people. I visited their graves, um, visited their former home sites, everything. And, you know, that I think was the main thing that intrigued me is that there was at least something, at least some factual basis to the story, even if it's just the people in places. So I had something that I could latch on to and then follow uh, down a path, which would yield more leads uh, over the years. And with the ultimate goal, of course, being not to determine necessarily whether the bell witch really turned one of the farm workers into a mule or not, but to determine how much, if any, of the story is true and how did the story actually get started. And more importantly, how has it survived over so many years even with different generations telling it and embellishing it, you know, so it's my goal is more so the meta story than trying to figure out what kind of entity uh, this character was or that character, but the story of the story, a.k.a. the meta story. So right. that's a very short version of what I'm all about. Well, you know, there are so many stories in especially smaller communities and and many of them have actually done the smart thing and tried to make these into tourist attractions. I know in my community here, the settlement where I live in, or the subdivision that I live in, or community, I should call it, of uh, 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia, there's only a 1,000 people who live here. And when this realty family came up here to build this, it was supposed to be a getaway for the posh Vancouverites to be able to go into the wilderness to have another second home out in the country in a lake country type area. And one of the legends that was produced was of a lady named Agnes McVie. Now, there is some speculation as to whether or not this lady actually existed. Any relation to Christine? No. No. Oh, okay. I'm not, sorry. I had to ask that. Sorry. That's just the musician no, in me. I have to ask yes. that. Yeah, not a problem. Not a problem. But the, the legend of Agnes goes back to around 1860, 1865, where she is alleged to have murdered 60, 65 men coming down from Alaska and the Klondike with buckets and bags and satchels full of gold. And her theory was, you know, she would get them drunk. She would have prostitutes at her little in, shall we say, or post house and what we call it. Brothel and, is what uh, we call them here. Yeah. And and what would happen was is she would get them drunk, get them laid, and murder them. And that is kind of the way it went. And then rob them of their gold. And because this was there was no police force in Canada at that time, the RCMP still hadn't originated. It was lawless country. So she was able to get away with it. And Little do we know that it's a complete fabrication to try and draw people here to make the area a little bit more exciting. And a lot of communities have done that. But there's a lot of communities, too, who have taken these events, like Roswell or or Point Pleasant with Mothman, and, and there's others, who have taken these paranormal or supernatural happenings and turned them into money makers and money generators for the community and it's been amazing so it's good to see that the legend of the bell witch continues on within the community and within the folklore is it not well i think the the legend needs to stay out there and you know one of the goals of my life as far as the research is concerned is to promote and celebrate the legend and, you know, 
I know some p- different people have different motives on it. As far as money making, you know, the money that I make off of all the hard work I do will each year would roughly get me maybe one and a half trips to the grocery store after all my expenses yes. are paid. So, <laughs> so, you know, basically after each year I can stuff my gut for a couple of days. Uh, other than that, anything that comes to me, I have to send it to the government. Um, I'm not sure what you guys' structure is there, but the state in which I live has one of the highest tax rates in the nation. Um, there's sales tax. There's um, all, all kinds of – you have to pay sales tax when you buy things. Uh, of course, you have to also uh, remit sales tax and net it out of everything you sell. So, you know, it's the, I, I don't – make again i make hardly nothing off of it i make a whole lot more money off of my musical uh endeavors working as a session guitarist um as well as my real job um my day job with technology but you know some communities have been able to capitalize uh and make money uh, as a result of these stories, I, I don't know how much money they make, but I know that tourism is a big thing, especially if you get a lot of it. And consistent tourism is better than just a couple of spurts every now and then. Um, you know, using the Bell Witch as an example, uh, the town of Adams, well, I guess first thing I say is. I know a lot of the people involved. I hear things about all of that, the town, everything about it, uh, the tourism. I hear about it daily almost. And like I say, I know a lot of a lot of insiders, so I know what's going on there. And I don't I don't know how much, if any, the town of Adams has profited from it. I know that the legend is a draw to the town. People come through there. They look at the um, Adams Museum, which is free to go through. But, you know, they can eat in the schoolhouse cafeteria. They may have to buy gasoline. Um, there's a couple of uh, little, sh- few little shops in the same building with the museum. They may b- buy a few items, items there. Um, and, you know, there's some other things done in and around the city um, that are related, very much related to the Bell Witch legend, but the town itself does not benefit off of those uh, as much as uh, private organizations and private individuals who set those up. Also, another big draw to the town is the uh, one of the only areas that you can go to on the old Bell Farm now, which is the Bell Witch Cave, which is at the northwest corner of what used to be the John Bell Farm. Uh, That's something that draws a whole lot of people uh, to Adams, Tennessee each year. But, um, and you know, those people spend money, you know, in the city and there's tax allocations and all kinds of stuff. So, um, you know, the visitors to the cave account for a lot of the income as well. Um, You know, You've also got other places. Well, let me back up just a minute. With Adams, the the place is not just crawling with tourists all the time. You know, on a typical given day, you may have maybe four or five people who wander into town, you know, and say, hey, what's this about this bell witch I've heard of? Or, hey, I've read the books about the bell witch, or I've seen one of the movies. Uh, what all is here? I want to check everything out. That's typically what you get. Consistent tourism, but not a lot. Now, reverse a little bit here in time. 1999, a movie came out by the name of the Blair Witch Project. In a precursory documentary leading up to it to the movie somebody said the word bell witch so that plus the fact that bell witch and blair witch kind of have a similar ring drew a whole lot of attention to the bell witch case and as a result you know beginning a couple of months 
before the movie was released, but after it had been announced, all the way until like a year and a half or so after the Blair Witch Project had had been released, Adams had a whole lot of tourists. In fact, the first two or three weeks after the Blair Witch Project, I mean, there were lines of cars out there on Highway 41 waiting to pull in somewhere. That's how busy it was. And, yeah, it was just amazing. And, I mean, I, w- I was getting hit with emails right and left and needing to know this, need to know that, wanted me to take them around, drive them around the roads and point things out from the road and stuff like that. So I pretty much ended up having to just about live up there, you know, trying to, you know, promote the legend and sat- uh, satisfy as many Bellwitch fans as I could. Then after that, everything died down for several years. It was like you didn't even hear of the Bell Witch anymore. Then 2006, in May of 2006, the movie called An American Haunting came out, and the same thing all over again as what uh, they saw with the Blair Witch Project. Now, the way it works, essentially any time any TV show like a documentary or paranormal type uh, thrill show talks about or features the Bell Witch legend, there will be a short-term surge in interest and resulting tourism. So that that's how the tourism works there in Adams. Interesting. Very interesting indeed in regards to that. With the way the people are in the community, I think it's always important to try and get a, a gauge of, of what they're like. Do they just go about their daily lives, you know, not really talking about the subject or kind of, you know, sloughing it off as just a bunch of hooey and folklore rather than a true story? Or are they quite accepting of it that it is part of their community? It is part of their image. Well, you have a whole different mix of people. And I know that sounds strange when we're talking a town that has a population now of roughly only maybe 300 people at the most. Um, You know, some people love the Bell Witch legend and the history behind the Bell family and the different locations. Others couldn't care less. Then you have some residents who are absolutely sick and tired of hearing about it. They won't discuss it, they, or they think it's silly. Uh, you mentioned the BW word in their presence, and they will turn around and walk away. So even in such a small community, you have all different types of opinions about the legend. You mentioned a couple of movies there in regards to it, how it's brought kind of attention, maybe indirectly, to the Bell Witch When a movie like that comes out where it's about witches, where it's about hauntings and and just weird, strange things that's happening in the forest, and I can tell you right now, I I realize a lot of people will probably roll their eyes at me when I say this, but the suspense of the Blair Witch Project scared the living daylights out of me. I was on the edge of my seat, even though you never really saw anything happen. But it always has to be good for you know, bringing attention to the subject of the Bell Witch when something like this happens in Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah, it brings attention to the Bell Witch when something like that happens. Uh, Like I say, you know, the Blair Witch had nothing to do with the Bell Witch, and I know that for a fact. But the Bell Witch was, like I said, was mentioned in a precursory documentary, plus the names have a similar ring. So that brought attention to the Bell Witch. And, you know, it helps out, you know, like I say, with, with the tourism and then the interest. I know anytime something like that happens, my emails, uh, Facebook fan page likes, and things like that will double, um, not in total, but like the rate at which I get emails or Facebook fan page likes, that rate will double for a week or two. So, you know, anytime I'll, you know, I get in a Google alert or Google report, you know, which I keep track of all that, and there's a huge surge, I know that somebody on TV or something or another has mentioned it. Uh, mentioned the Bell Witch. And sure enough, I could just type Bell Witch into Google and I can see what happened that caused that, you know, surge of interest. And I think it's good. You know, like I say, one of my, one of my, well, actually my main mission, other than to get to the bottom of why that story is there and what happened or didn't happen to make the story there, is to promote, enlighten people, 
and celebrate the legend. It is a it is an absolute mystery. You know, not so much as whether this thing really turned the farm worker into a mule or whether this thing really made Betsy Bell vomit up brass pins and needles, but more so, was this thing real? Was it not? If not, what was it? Why were all these people, very respectable co- people in the community, documenting this? You know, what was going on here? You know, that is a big mystery. And the passage of time makes evidence harder and harder to find. And potential evidence, uh, or I find even potential evidence, but harder, even harder to validate. I mean, you find a piece of potential evidence in the Bellwitch case. My experience has been 98% of the time I can toss it out because I, there's already other evidence that's solid that – uh, discredits it for some reason. But, you know, finding that 2% of evidence that you can validate, you know, it's it's really, really hard. It's a big challenge, and it's it's quite a mystery. And it's also, you know, people who have gotten into, really gotten into studying the case and trying to, you know, trying to unravel it and put together what it may have been or may not have been, um, you know, to a lot of those people, not all, but a lot of those people, it also becomes a lesson in critical thinking. And it is, that's especially helpful to people who are new to the field of paranormal investigation or just investigation, period. Because it teaches, or at least I teach, that not everything is going to be paranormal and not everything is not going to be paranormal. You know, we we have to look at everything. We have to balance it, weigh it objectively. What's good evidence? What's bad evidence? Who can you believe? Who can you not believe? You know, the whole whole right. line of critical thinking. So it's it's a it's it's a good thing, you know, for people to look at. And not- Pat, I'm going to get you to hold on right there, my friend. I'm, we're going to go to our first break of the show tonight because, well, we want to save your voice, and my voice is a little raspy right now as I'm getting over a cold. Pat Fitzhugh is our guest tonight. He is the number one researcher of the Bell Witch. His website, bellwitch.org, if you want to check it on out. We're going to learn about the Bell Witch. What is it right after this? You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. 
Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Hi there, this is Geraldine Orozco from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. Did you know Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi there, this is Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm here to take you on a paranormal journey each Saturday and Sunday night. Why change the station when you have it all right here? Together, we'll hang out and share some strange and scary stories. And don't forget, we have Psychic Sundays as well, so come tune in Spaced Out Weekend. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com, where we own the night. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? 
Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Welcome back to the second half hour of Spaced Out Radio. Tonight, I'm your host, Dave Scott. We're talking to Bell Witch with Pat Fitzhugh. Bellwitch.org is the website if you want to check it on out. Pat, welcome back. Hey, how's it going? That was a short break. I'm, I'm glad to get back in here. We were, we were really on a roll. You, definitely, we were on the roll. And I, I want to get into this half hour, my friend, uh, talking about the legend. Let's go back in history to around 1817 or so and the Bell family. Tell us about what happened there in Adams, Tennessee. Okay, well, the Bell family had originally come to the Adams area, then known as the Red River Settlement, from North Carolina, Hal- Halifax County, North Carolina, in 1804. Things went well for them. They uh, ended up on a farm, 228 acres. They later added another 100 acres to it. They cleared a lot of fields. They sold a lot of crops. John Bell was accepted and appointed as an elder in the Red River Baptist Church. Everything seemed great uh, for the first several years. They even had some more children. But then in the early fall of 1817, one morning when Mr. Bell was out inspecting his crops, he came upon this very strange-looking animal. They say it resembled it was like it had the head of a rabbit and the body of a dog. And he wasn't really sure what it was. He hadn't seen anything like that before. It kind of startled him. But... You know, he did what anybody else would have done back then and what I would still do right now. He, of course, pulled up his muzzle loader and and got ready to shoot the thing. Well, as soon as he took aim and fired his shot, the thing vanished. It didn't run away. It just flat out disappeared. And he couldn't believe his eyes. But at the same time, You know, he was 67 years old, and he realized that maybe his eyes had failed him. They weren't as good as they were when he was like 27, and he didn't really think much about it. But then a few weeks later, one of the older sons, Drew Bell, had been out on the farm doing something and was almost attacked by a very large bird. And, um, you know, he told the family about it that night when they were eating. And, of course, they all dismissed it as it being an eagle. And maybe he did something, got too close to a nest or something. It was a mother eagle that was mad or something. But he insisted that this thing had a wingspan much greater than that of an eagle. And as soon as he tried to point his gun at it, he couldn't even shoot it. As soon as he pointed his gun at it, it's like this thing, bird thing knew exactly what was going on, and it flew away very quickly. So, you know, those two incidents I just described weren't really of any major concern to the family, nor was it a major concern when a week later, the youngest daughter, Betsy Bell, and her brother, younger brother, Richard Bell, came into the house yelling and screaming at about dinner time one night, scared to death. They'd been up in the woods and came upon what they described as being a dead woman hanging from a tree by the neck. And as soon as she saw them, or they got in front of her, even though her eyes were shut, tears started rolling down this dead woman's face. 
And they turned around and got out of there. And, of course, this whole story was dismissed as, uh, you know, just being children's imagination. And they got scared and ran off. And you know how that goes. That wasn't a big deal. Uh, But then as the winter season began to set in, the family began hearing what they described later described as being knocks on the outside walls of their two-story log home. Sometimes these lo- these knocks would be by the door, other times near the back of the house. And Mr. Bell would send his older sons out there to see who the scoundrel was who was trying to do all of that. I mean, it was pretty obvious that maybe some kid that lived in the settlement or somebody was just trying to play tricks on them. But the sons would always return inside the house empty-handed. They never saw a culprit. Then, after a few weeks of that, they began hearing what sounded like stones being thrown up onto the roof of the house and then chains being dragged up and down the upstairs hall in the middle of the night. And... John Bell and his wife Lucy would get up, they would light their candles, they would check the hallways. There would be nobody there, there would be no chains. They would send John Jr. or Drury Bell out, look outside, see if there had been anybody up there throwing rocks, or if there were any rocks on the ground where they'd thrown them up on the roof, and then they rolled back off the roof and hit the ground. But there were no big rocks out there. So that's when things really, really began to get strange. And at that point, Mr. Bell realized there was something, there was some presence of some type in his home and on his farm that he did not know what was, but obviously had great strength and there was a great mystery behind it. And he kept that feeling to himself for for a good while you know, a couple of months, but then everything really blew wide open when the kids, the young kids especially, would wake up in the middle of the night complaining that they had felt something tugging at their bed covers and occasionally heard what sounded like rats or mice gnawing at their bedposts. And then not long after that, The youngest daughter, Betsy Bell, woke up screaming really loud one night. John and Lucy Bell came in there, and she was holding her face. They held a candle up to her face, and when she pulled her little hands off her face, she had welts all over her face. It said that some hand, an invisible hand, a hand she could not see, had slapped her very hard as she lay sleeping. So it was at that point that the entire family agreed that, yes, something something was there. They didn't know what it was. It was very strong, and it was obviously not very nice, perhaps even evil. But there wasn't much they could do about it because of a couple of details. One actually three details. One was, this was only 125 years or so after the Salem witch trials. It was only five years after the series of earthquakes along the New Madrid fault line had happened, which caused everybody to believe that the world was coming to an end. Then the third reason, and the big reason problem, is that John Bell not only was a church-going man, he was an elder or a leader in the Red River Baptist Church. Now, put together the timing and the events that had happened in the years earlier, plus the fact they were living right at the center of the buckle of the Bible Belt. Well, an elder of a church does not all of a sudden go around announcing that a supernatural or paranormal entity lives in his home with his family. I mean, best case scenario, he would be kicked out of the church. Worst case, he could have been murdered or burned or who knows what. 
So that's the way he felt. And he ordered his family to total secrecy in the matter. But it wasn't long. Yeah. And, you know, but it wasn't long until people in the settlement began to notice dark circles under Mr. Ms. Bell's eyes and under the eyes of the children. The family always appeared to be very tired and worn out, almost zombie-like. Betsy Bell and her siblings would often fall asleep while in school during the day. So people began asking the family, you know, what's wrong? Why? It's it's like you guys are living at night. You're getting no sleep, and then you're trying to live during the daytime, too. So about that time, you know, that really put Mr. Bell and Mrs. Bell between a rock and a hard spot. They They couldn't tell anybody, but yet people were catching on. Something had to give. So Mr. Bell went to his best friend and next-door neighbor, James Johnson. Mr. Johnson had a very good reputation in the community. He was a very religious man, and people looked up to him and could confide in him that he wouldn't tell people's private business. He was a very compassionate, loving man. When Mr. Bell told him what all had been going on in and around his home for the past year, Mr. Johnson erupted into laughter and told Mr. Bell, all of these things you're, you're having, seeing happen are the works of your children. They are playing tricks on you. They know that you've gotten old, you're not as sharp as you used to be, and they're making a joke out of the whole thing, and you just can't catch them. So just don't worry about this. Just go on and ignore it, and they'll leave you alone. Well, he realized by the look in Mr. Bell's eyes and his trembling voice and the deep sorrow with which he spoke that Mr. Bell was very serious about this, and he did not think it was a laughing matter. So Mr. Johnson agreed to spend the night uh, with the Bells just to see for himself what would happen. In fact, that very night, he and his wife Patsy came over to the Bell home. They enjoyed a good dinner. They sang a lot of hymns and said a lot of prayers, which was a typical night in any home in the Red River settlement back in those days. But after they had gone to bed, and about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, Mr. Johnston was startled and sprung out of bed. His bed had begun shaking. And once he got out of bed, something hit him square in the back. He turned around and nothing was there. And the bed was still shaking. His wife began to wake up in panic. And he shouted, in the name of the Lord, who are you? What do you want? And as soon as he shouted that, everything stopped, at least for that night. And it's probably doubtful Mr. Johnson or his wife got any sleep the rest of the night. Then the next morning, Mr. Johnson explained to John and Lucy Bell that he thought what they had been experiencing was a spirit, like you read about in the Bible, but an evil spirit. And he suggested that the both of them go over to Reverend Fort's home and explain it to him. Reverend Fort was the pastor of Red River Baptist Church. And, of course, Mr. Bell was very reluctant to bring this matter up to anybody outside the family, much less the pastor of the church. But he really had no choice, and he knew it was a matter of time before Gossip would start, and no telling what he would be accused of. So Mr. Johnson and Bell both rode over to Reverend Fort's place, explained the whole situation to him. And as it turns out, the pastor was very compassionate. He believed what they had told them. He agreed with Mr. Johnson about this thing being a bad spirit. He said a prayer for the Bell family and asked that whatever this horrible thing was could be eradicated, move on. 
And the three men decided that they would continue night after night, beginning that night, to meet at the Bell home late at night and try and understand more about what this thing was and try and get rid of it by praying, asking it to leave, doing anything they could. And above all, they made it a pact that this would be a secret. Word could not get out, no matter what. Okay, so fast forward two weeks, and people from Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, and Eastern Tennessee were coming to the Bell Farm in droves, wanting to know what the hoopla was. You know, what was all this happening? Some felt that it was truly an act of the supernatural. Others really didn't know what to think. They just wanted to know if anything was going on. And then you had the skeptics who came by and sa- came by the house and proclaimed that the bells were making up the entire thing as a way to get people to come to their house so they could charge them for room and board. And it seemed that the more people who came to witness this, the stronger and more violent its acts became. And after a while, it began to try and speak in whispers. Nobody could understand what it said. But in essence, it fed off of the energy or collective energy of all these people and the fear and attention that resulted. It fed off of that, got bigger and stronger And over time, these whispers developed into a barely discernible voice. People described it as sounding like a very elderly and feeble old lady who was trying desperately to tell them something, but whose voice was so weak and feeble that it just couldn't quite say it. And people would ask, the million dollar question over and over who are you what do you want why don't you leave and this thing would try and say different things at different times one time it said it was the spirit of somebody who was buried in the woods nearby another time it said it was the spirit of somebody looking for a lost tooth another time it said that it was james johnson's great aunt Another time, it said it was a spirit of an early explorer who was buried nearby and who had put a pot of uh, a trunk of gold underneath a big rock down by the Red River and that it wanted them, the bells, to dig up the treasure and give it to Betsy. And after every statement this thing made as to its identity, Mr. Bell and his family, Mr. Johnson, sometimes even Reverend Ford, would get together and do whatever this thing said had to be done to get rid of it, including digging under the big rock by the Red River to find this supposed trunk of treasure. And every time, they would always fail, and this voice, which by this time had developed into a normal speaking voice after a couple of months, would laugh and call them a bunch of old fools and say that they would believe anything. They were a bunch of old gullible suckers. So apparently this thing, even though it was very evil and arrogant, it seemed to have a sense of humor in a way, at least it laughed uh, on occasion. But it seems, aside from the skeptics who showed up, the brunt of the physical disturbances were aimed more so at Betsy Bell and John Bell, the father, than anyone else. It was during this time, which by now we're up to mid-1818, it was during this time that Betsy would have these problems where she would like actually go into trances, sometimes seizures, And then all of a sudden, people would hear slapping sounds, and she would begin grabbing her face and her body and moving in just exactly the way she would if somebody had hit her. 
And then she would snap out of these things, these episodes. Sometimes she could remember what happened. And she said she was hit and violently beaten and slapped. Other times she couldn't remember what had happened. But the onlookers did remember. And, you know, they watched in total terror. You know, it just cut right to the core of their souls to see such a pretty, sweet, young 12-year-old girl being essentially beaten within inches of her life for doing absolutely nothing wrong. And yet there was not a thing they could do about it because these were invisible hands. That's incredible. And and we yeah. only got about a minute here before we got to go to break, Pat. But during that time when she was showing the physical trauma from these, this spirit, were any men in the area maybe accused of being violent towards her? No, not at all that I've heard of. At least there was nothing anywhere on any records, public records, or any manuscripts stating that anybody had been mean or violent towards her. Um, She did just a short time Uh, Like in late 1818, she began dating or courting her young neighbor named Joshua Gardner. But, I mean, he was only just a few years older than she was. He wouldn't even be considered a man just yet. Um, But, no, no reports of anything. She was actually historically known as a very bright, bubbly personality and very likable little girl. Wow. Wow. Very interesting indeed. We're going to be back with Pat Fitzhugh with hour number two. More history into the legend of the Bell Witch. You've got to tune into this. It's kind of an eerie tale that claims to be the truth. We'll be back with more on Spaced Out Radio right after this. Every night on Space Out Radio, we have places for you to hang out. Hi, this is Carl. Join our SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook for live chat. On Twitter, using hashtag Spaced Out Radio, you can also join us in our Spreaker chat room. Check us out on Instagram at Dave Scott SOR. All of our archives are free on YouTube at Spaced Out Radio. By the way, I'll be watching you at your window until you do. Bye! Looking for the stories of the strange and weird that you will find hard to find anywhere else? Check out the SOR Newswire on our website. Our writers, led by Captain Shirk, are scouring the world for the oddest and most bizarre stories we can find. Everything from weird crime to suspenseful and paranormal. We're working hard for you to bring you the most intriguing news of your day. Check out the SOR Newswire at spacedoutradio.com today. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. So you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. Escapewatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. 
We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? If you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media, then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. 
You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Saturday and Sunday, Tess Nicole Thomas is back with Spaced Out Weekend. She gets going at 9 o'clock Pacific, midnight Eastern at spacedoutradio.com. Hi to everyone listening in on the SOR Radio Network and Deep Talk Radio. Remember, all of our archives are free for you at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Hmm. I hate Fridays. Zizivas. Zizivas is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, soon shop at our brand new store, read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, and so much more. Tonight, we're talking legends, and we're off to Adams, Tennessee, where the legend of the Bell Witch continues to haunt that little community up to today. The leading researcher on this is Pat Fitzhugh, our guest tonight. His website is bellwitch.org. He's probably the leading investigator in regards to this paranormal phenomena. Pat, welcome back. Hey, glad to be back. I'm I'm just chomping at the bit to keep talking about this. Oh, Amazing story. I've rested my voice, uh, kind of, and <laughs> ready to ready to rock and roll. Well, I mean, you you got us to about 1818, where there was an incredible story of the young lady who was starting to show some major physical bruising and scarring from being attacked by a creature that no one really saw. Right. It was Betsy Bell. And, you know, like I said earlier, it seemed that Betsy and her father bore the brunt of the physical disturbances, although other members of the family, not all, but most of the others also occasionally uh, encountered physical violence at the hands of this thing. Um, John Bell, the father, wasn't really the subject of much of the violence at all until later. But right now it's mainly Betsy and also, you know, like I mentioned, her siblings encountered some of it. There are accounts of where chairs would be kicked out from under people. Um, her her younger brothers on occasion getting slapped or pushed, uh, and even a baby getting spanked. Not in the Bell home, but in a neighbor's home, because it seemed you know it seemed that this thing followed the Bells even though most all these disturbances occurred and are allegedly occurred in a six square mile area. You know, the big thing after these attacks and everything got so bad, the big thing for Betsy was getting out of the house, you know, trying to stay with somebody else, spend the night, spend a week or so, whatever, and see if she could get any peace. Well, it turns out this thing followed her. Uh, she spent the night with James Johnson's family, and the entity followed her there, spanked a baby, or allegedly spanked a baby, and then made the comment that that baby will never, ever cry again when I tell it to shut up. So, yeah, it was kind of mean, even the babies. And also at this time, People began to wonder, you know, as I mentioned earlier about skeptics and what the, whether the Bells were, you know, charging money or they had this whole thing rigged up just to thrill people. And on one occasion, a man came from England to investigate, and he made it to the Bell Farm and promptly announced that he was a fraud investigator and witch hunter, as he called himself, and that he was going to prove that this was nothing but a hoax. And he suffered the same fate as the other skeptics who showed up, meaning that everything was quiet for the first couple days of the visit to make him think 
that, yeah, he was on to something, that the Bells were up to something wrong, and that they knew he would catch them if they tried something, so that's why they remained quiet. But then after a couple of days, the skeptics, including this Englishman, began experiencing the same thing Betsy and her siblings were experiencing, with the bed covers being pulled, getting hit and slapped, uh, that sort of thing. But this Englishman has had something very special happen to him. According to the early accounts of the legend, he woke up one night while spending the night at the Bell home. In the middle of the night, hearing his parents back in England, hearing his parents' voice, voices who were actually back in England, having a discussion about something. And he really did not know what to make of that. But then after a couple of days, he got on the horse he had been using and fled the place in terror. Not sure what happened that was the straw that broke the camel's back. But he hightailed it out of there like the other ones ended up doing. But then several months later, the Bells received a letter all the way from England from this investigator who had said that when he had returned home to England, he asked his parents what they had been talking about on the night or the date that he thought it was when he had heard their voices. And they told him, and it was exactly what he had, the voices he heard while he was at the Bell Farm in Adams, Tennessee, the same discussion. So I thought that was very interesting. Another interesting thing came up. The entity which had finally learned how to talk really loved to argue religion and also point out people's faults. It seemed this thing really loved to argue with the preachers. And on occasion, it was even heard in church, singing along with the hymns at the Red River Baptist Church and Drake's Pond Methodist Church, which were 13 miles apart. On one Sunday evening, both Reverend Fort of the Baptist Church and Reverend Gunn of the Methodist Church were present in the Bell's home talking with John and Lucy Bell when the entity spoke up and mentioned that both preachers did an outstanding job with their sermons that morning. They had preached their sermons at the exact same hour, but 13 miles apart. Lucy Bell challenged that. She said, no, we did not hear you. You were not in church. You couldn't have been in church. We didn't know you were there. And the entity said, oh, but Lucy, I was at Red River Church. And she began, or the entity began to quote word for word Reverend Fort's sermon using his own voice. And that just totally shocked everybody who was present. Then Lucy Bell spoke up and said, hey, wait a minute. Okay, then there's no way you could have known how good Reverend Gunn's sermon was because you were at Red River Church and they were preaching at the same hour. Then the entity proceeded to quote Reverend Gunn's sermon word for word and in his own voice. So it's like this thing could be at two places at the same time, could retain everything it heard and then speak in other people's voices. It was just just very, very um, shocking. That is eerie. That is eerie. And it really did a lot of of good for hushing up the skeptics who were present at that time who had been saying that the Bells were making all of this up. Uh, to raise money, um, which there was never any record of the Bells charging any money to anybody who came by the place. 
Uh, in fact, one account even mentioned the fact that, you know, they had heard that the Bells had been accused of doing this as a hoax. And they guaranteed that the Bells had never charged anybody one penny for staying. In fact, they wanted people to come by, see if the people could get rid of this thing or figure out what it was. And as word traveled, continued to travel, one man heard about it, uh, an American military leader. And this man lived about 50 miles away from the Bell Farm at the time. And he knew of the Bells and where their farm was. It seemed that John Bell's older sons, two, possibly the third one, I'm not sure on the third one, but at least the two oldest sons, had fought under this military commander in the War of 1812, both at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend and at the Battle of New Orleans. So he had heard of the Bell family. He knew it was the Bell family up in Robertson County. And another way he knew about that and made the association was that this man, military commander, owned land just a couple miles away from the John Bell farm. He didn't live there. There were no structures on the land. It was just a piece of property the man owned. And he had been up there to check on his property before. So he decided he was going to investigate and his name was Major General Andrew Jackson, who years later became President of the United States. Interesting. Yes. And, well, there's a catch to all this, which I'll, t I'll tell you here in a little bit. Um, according to the legend, Jackson and his men, entourage of men, approached the property line of the Bell Farm, and their wagon suddenly stopped. The horses refused to go. And Jackson's men yelled at him, tried everything they could do, and the horses just would not respond. Andrew Jackson started cursing at the horses. They still wouldn't go. Then a voice was allegedly heard coming out of the trees, a very loud whisper, saying, General Jackson, it's good to see you. You can go on now, but I'll visit you later tonight. And not another er word was uttered that afternoon. But the horses suddenly started walking again. And Jackson and his entourage set up camp in the front yard of the Bell home. They hung around the place. Mr. Jackson, or General Jackson went into the Bell home, talked with the Bell family, caught up with the older sons of the Bells, and had a good old time later on. Jackson and his men and the Bell family ate a big dinner, had a lot of fun singing hymns, and then spent a couple hours listening to General Jackson tell a bunch of very entertaining stories from his military career and different battles. But then at one point, one of Jackson's men made note of the fact that this so-called Bell Witch did not manifest itself in any way that everything had been quiet and everything had gone very normal throughout their visit thus far. And that he suspected this was because he had a pistol in his pistol. He had a silver bullet that was called the witch killer. And that this thing entity knew he was there and had that bullet and it was afraid of him. Well, as soon as he said that, all of a sudden, he felt a, a very hard hit right in his back, something hitting really hard in the back. So he spun around, getting ready to knock the heck out of whoever it was that had hit him in the back, only to find that there was nobody there. But then he suddenly experienced a very hard kick right in his posterior region, and so hard that it kicked him all the way out the front door of the bell home. Then the entity spoke up and said, okay, General Jackson, now you know that I am here and that that man of yours is an old fool. He's not a witch hunter. His bullet will not kill me or anybody else. He's nothing but an old fraud. And I'll tell you what, General, you have another fraud in your party. 
and I'll come back tomorrow night and expose him. Well, obviously, Jackson's men were all ready to leave, you know, coming up with every excuse they could to get the heck out of there because they didn't want to be exposed as a fraud the following night. But not surprisingly, General Jackson felt differently. And he said, well, boys, we're staying here. If there's a fraud in my party, I want to know who this, who it is. So stick around. Well, they all went on out to the yard, got in their tents, and went to bed late that night. But then at about sunup the next morning, Witness several people witnessed Jackson and his entourage traveling south through nearby Springfield, Tennessee, heading back toward Nashville. So it's not really known what happened later that night that made Jackson change his mind, and to such an ex, uh, to such a strong effect that he didn't even stick around for breakfast. That they they hightailed it as soon as at first light. Um, So that's the Andrew Jackson part of the legend. Now, venturing off of the legend and into my research, did this Mm -hmm. really, did this really happen? Probably not. And here's why. During that period, Jackson was out of the Tennessee area for a lot of time. Also, during that same period, in the 1819 time frame, he was also sick. It's highly unlikely that this happened. Now, given what I said earlier, he did know of the Bell Sons through the military, and he did, in fact, own property near the Bell Farm, suggests that at some point in time, he might have visited the Bell home um, when he went up to check on his property. But there is no proof, there is no writings, any, any old journals or manuscripts or anything to the effect that he actually encountered the Bell Witch or that he visited the area during the exact same time frame as the Bell Witch legend. So because of that, I cannot say that the Bell Witch and Andrew Jackson really got into it. Um, It's just one of many parts of the legend that we cannot prove and we can't say definitely happened, but only that there's no credible evidence saying it did, but there is credible evidence in the form of writings and through the Hermitage Historical Society that establishes the fact that he most likely had no reason to be in the area at that time. So with Jackson, after this, shortly after this, actually, the spirit or entity made some shopping, shocking revelations as the preachers uh, and the Bell family and some of their friends continued to try and communicate with this thing to find out what it was and to get rid of it, it once admitted or said that it was actually the spirit or the doings or conjuring of a lady named Kate Batts, and its mission was to kill John Bell and make him die the slowest and most miserable death possible. Wow. Okay. Some of this was easy for people to believe other parts were shocking first of all kate bats she and her family lived about a couple of miles away from the bell farm her husband had been injured in an accident a farming accident years earlier and was basically paralyzed and could not do the farm work meaning that mrs bats and her children had to take care of their farm They did not have much money at all, and certainly not enough money to pay for slaves on the farm, like some families did in the Old South. So Mrs. Batts was also very strange in her speaking, very, uh, not really aloof, but more uh, eccentric. She was a big, uh, known as a big gossip, 
Uh, she was known to try and use a bunch of fancy words to impress people, yet she did not even know the meanings of those words. Thus, she didn't make any sense. So the short version is that many people in the Red River settlement frowned upon her and thought she was crazy. So when the entity claimed to be the working of Kate Batts, people were like, okay, that makes sense because that lady's crazy. And from that point on, people started calling the entity by the name of Kate, and it would answer to the name of Kate. Now, from my research, Kate Batts had nothing whatsoever to do with the legend. I mean, she was falsely accused of it. People were gullible enough to believe it. And a lot of people, even to this day, feel that she was behind it in some way, um, supposedly because of a dispute between her and John Bell. But in my research, I found out that there was no such dispute. There was a dispute between her brother-in-law and John Bell. Then there's also the myth that uh, she had a bad land deal with John Bell, uh, which is also not true. Uh, the land deal that went bad with, with Josiah Fort, the brother of Reverend Fort of the Red River Baptist Church, and the church decided it in Mr. Bell's favor, and Josiah Fort was excommunicated from the church. So that's how that set up. But none of that had anything to do with Kate Batts. And, of course, the other one is what we call the North Carolina theory or the smokehouse theory, where Mr. Bat or Mr. Bell and Mrs. Batts had something going on. He got mad at her one day. He took her into the smokehouse and killed her. She came back from the dead to haunt his family. Well, that's not true because she outlived Mr. Bell by 23 years. So there's no way she could have come back from the dead to haunt him. But anyway, bottom line, I don't feel Kate Batts had anything to do with it. Now, the second thing that shocked people, the shocking revelation that the entity called Kate made was that it was going to kill John Bell. John Bell was a very well-liked man in the community. He was very well-respected. He simply had not done anything that would make anybody want to kill him. There was an occasion where he took legal action against another man because the man was cruel to a slave and he didn't believe in cruelty to slaves. Uh, but, you know, other than that, in this land dispute with Josiah Fort, I mean, he hadn't had any problems with anybody. And nobody had any idea of why that anybody would want to kill John Bell. And on that note, Pat, I'm going to get you to hold on. We're going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Pat Fitzhugh is our guest tonight talking to Bell Witch. What a great history. What a great storyteller. We'll be back with more Bell Witch on Spaced Out Radio right after this. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Hi there, this is Geraldina Roscoe from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best five dollars a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. 
Did you know Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi there, this is Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm here to take you on a paranormal journey each Saturday and Sunday night. Why change the station when you have it all right here? Together, we'll hang out and share some strange and scary stories. And don't forget, we have Psychic Sundays as well, so come tune in Spaced Out Weekend. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com, where we own the night. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. We passed the halfway point of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you with us on a Friday night heading into the weekend. We got Pat Fitzhugh here with us. He is probably the world's premier researcher on the legend of the Bell Witch. His website, bellwitch.org. That's bellwitch.org, telling an incredible story here about the history of the Bell Witch. Pat, welcome back to the show. Hey, hey, hey. We're having fun here. Having fun. This is great. We're getting a lot of a lot of good things covered. Absolutely. I want to ask you a question here in regards to all of this strange paranormal activity that a lot of people were now starting to understand was happening. Was the town always paranormal or was this a a first of its kind in the area where people were actually getting very scared about it? Okay, I don't really know. I do know that the Bell Witch legend is the first known or publicized encounter of that type in the area. But that doesn't mean things haven't happened earlier. And I do know that some things happened. Well, I'll take that back. The... I've heard that there had been some Native American and settlers skirmishing or fighting back and forth along the Red River in about the 1780s to 1790s. Uh, but again, that's not paranormal itself. That's those were living people. Uh, of course, residual energy may have led to some other things. I don't know. Uh, I do know that with the regards to the bell witch legend i know that that area many years later during the american civil war was the site of a skirmish uh, and there was some deaths there and also one man in even later years claimed to be the spirit of the bell witch and he was oddly murdered a short time later uh, some strange things have happened there. And, um, you know, but again, you know, as far as people encountering something paranormal in, in that general area, I really don't know of anything. But I do know that a few years earlier, when the New Madrid fault line erupted and had some of the most serious earthquakes ever, even though this was 200 miles away, it was felt in the Middle Tennessee region, and I do know that history tells us that in general, people who felt this thing did not understand or know what it was. Some thought it was the coming of Christ. Others thought it was a warning that they were living wrong. Um, people were really scared, and I think they pretty much all thought that it was a supernatural experience. Interesting. Interesting. So when you or when the family, the Bell family, continued to have these experiences and they started getting a little bit more haywire each and every time and the actions of this creature, whatever it was, started getting a little bit more violent and and scary 
evil, if we want to call it that way, why didn't the family move? Why didn't they just decide that it was enough and we have to go elsewhere? You know, that's one of the most um, popular questions that I receive. And, you know, according to the legend, they discussed moving it pretty early on. And this thing spoke up and said that they could move to the end of the world if they wanted to, but it would be with them. It would be in the water they drank and the air they breathed, everything. In fact, that sounded so cool that many years later, a heavy metal band wrote a song about the Bell Witch and even used those words. But, uh, yeah, they talked about moving, and according to the legend, this thing said that it wouldn't do any good. And they didn't move. Now, many years later, some of their children did move to Mississippi. But during the period of the haunting, they nobody moved. Hmm. See, it seems so simple from hindsight being 2020. You get out. You just bolt. If, if you have some sort of evil entity attacking your family, you just don't stay there and take it. But I guess they did what they, they thought was right. They called in the local church priest to try and, and, and calm things down, but that would only be for intermittent periods, wouldn't it? Right. And, you know, I, you know, I question the whole part of the legend about them discussing moving and the thing telling them it wouldn't, wouldn't do any good. I mean, bottom line, I wasn't there, so I didn't hear, hear the conversation, if it even occurred. But, you know, if, it, if, if I had been a family on the early Tennessee frontier and was experiencing what they were, I would still move. You know, just take a chance to take the risk that maybe I could move and the thing wouldn't follow me. And then there's another question. Where would they go? I mean, they the areas to the west were pretty much uninhabited at the time. I mean, about all they could have done at that point would be go to Nashville and then take an early footpath called the Natchez Trace down to Mississippi and that was pretty much, you know, about it, which that happened eventually, but that was years later with some of their, their children. Otherwise, you know, my big thing is if they were going to move, this was happening and they were going to move, their obvious chance, obvious choice should have been moved back to North Carolina. But that may not have been too good of an idea because research shows that the reason they moved or one of the reasons they moved to Tennessee to begin with was because they had issues with the crops failing for several years in a row where they lived in North Carolina. So I don't know, the whole moving thing, very popular question, and there's not really a clear-cut answer. Well, I mean, if their crops were failing in North Carolina, did, did the family think they were cursed? Well, there is a North Carolina version of the Bell Witch legend, as is the Tennessee version and the Mississippi version. Under the North Carolina version of the legend, Mr. Bell had hired an overseer for his plantation in North Carolina, and it seemed that the overseer developed a fondness for John Bell's oldest daughter, Mary Bell, and had made some comments about wanting to date her or start courting her. And it made Mr. Bell very mad. And he ended up allegedly killing the man. And a short time after this happened, a series of strange things began to befall the family, one of which was that their crops were failing. Now, where we get down to the where the rubber meets the pavement here. We do know that crop failure was cited as a reason that they probably moved to Tennessee. And looking at old Almanac data and other data from the North Carolina area at that time, we do know that there were some problems with the crops in the 1804 uh, to 1805 time frame. 
having to do with actually a type of bacterial infection that somehow got into a lot of the crops and plants. So, you know, we know that much. But do we really know whether the spirit of a man allegedly killed by John Bell was responsible? We don't know. Hmm. How often was the was this entity attacking them? Was it a daily occurrence, an hourly occurrence, weekly, monthly? Was there a pattern that was able to be established on when things would heat up? Early on, there was, uh, with the exception of the three early experiences: uh, the anim- the bird, the strange animal, and the dead lady hanging from the tree that was reported, all of which were when daylight was going on. It seemed that for the first year, all the things in the house, uh, the sounds they heard, uh, the beating of the children, especially Betsy Bell, the strange looking candles they would see out at the edge of the woods across the field. All of that happened at night. It would usually start up. They say, they said, Richard Bell later said around eight, eight o'clock at night, and would sometimes last until three or four in the morning. But then after about the first year, as 1818 came into play, it seemed that all this would happen at night, but then there would be things happen in the daytime, similar things. So from that point on, it was a day and night thing. Very interesting. Very interesting. How were the children reacting at this time to everything? I mean, they must have been absolutely scared to go home, scared to go to bed, probably ridiculed at school, at church, in town. It had to be tough on the children. I would think so. And, you know, sadly, there is not really anything out there in the original legend that talked about you know, how the children felt and, you know, the toll it took on them, other than that they always appeared tired. Betsy would often have bruises, uh, but not anything, you know, with like, you know, how people treated them and all that. And of course they, you know, we knew they were scared, but there not a whole lot was said about that, unfortunately. But I, I would think it would be horrible, especially for the younger ones. I mean, like Richard Bell, when this first started out, he was only like five years old or so. And, you know, the uh, adults, the adults who actually experienced this were terrified. So you could imagine the kids would have been also. Absolutely. And, and that's why I asked about the children is, is whether or not they were being ridiculed, because let's face it, kids can be the cruelest of all. I mean, we worry about what adults say, but we can take it. You know what I'm saying? We, we've we built up a, a, a force field, if you could say, in regards to any type of bullying or, or things like that, whereas kids, they're so susceptible to everything. It's just scary for them at that time when they're going through this because their peers don't understand the true fear. They just want to make fun because they don't understand. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. Yeah, it's it, it's very interesting. There's a whole lot, you know, even though this is known as one of the most documented case, paranormal cases in history, there is still an awful lot of unanswered questions. I feel it is also the most complex and most unanswered case of paranormal history, as well as most documented in other words, a whole lot has been said, but not a whole lot has been done. I think a lot of things are still out there under the surface and due to the passage of time may never be found. So looking forward, I mean, this is 200 years ago now. And why is this story still so significant today? That's the big part of my research, finding out. You know, I think as more people more people hear about the story, 
more people, not all the people that hear about it, but more people in general become more intrigued by it, especially if they take time, you know, to read the book and think about it. You know, think about it. The people and places were real. Um, There was a lot of documentation from back in the day and even later about it. You know, it gives some people something to think about if they're interested in that sort of thing. And they began looking for answers themselves, sometimes forming opinions, other times just, you know, continuing to look into the case. You know, it's intriguing and baffling. And you go through all the evidence that's out there, and still you don't really have an answer. Essentially, all this evidence out here is basically ruling out a lot of things, but not necessarily ruling in anything, at least in terms of the paranormal part of the case. And, you know, a lot of people are intrigued by that. Then you have the other side, those who are not necessarily intrigued by the history and the mystery and controversy, but your your people who are just simply thrill seekers. You know, everybody, not everybody, but most people love a good scary story. You know, something that gets the adrenaline going, something that makes them look over their shoulder at night when they're alone. Um, you know, people love the thrill and the adrenaline rush of that. And certainly when you think about these things that happened in the Bell home and happened to Betsy, all of which occurred at the hands of a usually invisible entity, you get to wondering, you know, what, you know, is there something right next to my bed right now? Is there something coming in my window? Did I go somewhere haunted and something followed me home? You know, there's always that thrill factor and the the unknown and the guessing, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a big, big thing, very big thing, no matter how you look at it. How much death did this cause, whether it's through direct or indirect, like stress or heart attacks or anything like that? I have no way of knowing that. I do know that, I know we haven't gotten to it yet in the story, but the entity allegedly killed John Bell, or at least took credit for killing John Bell. But we don't know if that really happened or not. I mean, we know he died on December the 20th of 1820. But, and we know that the legend says Kate took credit for it. But we don't know. But, you know, anybody else hearing of any deaths related to the legend? I don't know. I mean, everybody dies at some point, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that it was related to this legend. We only got about three three and a half minutes before we got to go to break. You were going to say sorry, Pat. Oh, no, I was done with that part. Did we want to go ahead and finish that part of the story? Sure. Sure. Let's go. So, So the thing had professed that it wanted to kill John Bell and make him die a miserable death. And nobody could think of any reason why anybody or anything would want to kill John Bell. It was very, very shocking. And about that same time, word of Betsy Bell and Joshua Gardner's courtship really came to light in the community. And soon thereafter, they became engaged And everybody was really happy. They thought Betsy and Joshua would would be a good couple. And, of course, back then, people married at really young ages. But Kate was very much against that and told Betsy not to marry Joshua. But they decided they were going to continue courting and get, get married anyway. Then a short time later, Mr. Bell's health began to decline. He would complain of problems trying to swallow his food, felt like something was pushing out of his mouth against his cheeks. Um, These issues became worse over time. He began experiencing facial twitches and even reached the point where he would eventually have seizures uh, on occasion. 
And of course, the entity Kate kept taking credit for it, saying that she was killing John Bell and that this was just part of his dying a slow death. And she would laugh about it. People would ask her why. All she would say is that he was a bad man. But then again, Kate said everybody was bad, except for Lucy Bell and Calvin Johnson, who was the son of James Johnson, and Richard Powell, who was the school teacher in the community, and who, despite being many years older than her, professed a very open fondness for Betsy Bell, his student. Other than that, Kate thought everybody was bad, but especially John Bell, that's why she wanted to kill him. And let's see, based on our timing, this is probably a good time for me to back out of this part of the story, and then we take it again after break, if that works. Yeah, we got about a minute here before we need to go, so I'll just ask you a quick question. How much tension was in the family at that time between husband and wife, between the parents and children? I mean, I could just imagine the stress that is in that household at any given time. I mean, the emotions must have been overflowing. I'm sure they were. You know, that's another thing that was not ever really mentioned in the legend. But, you know, we just it's just left to our imagination, and we have to draw our conclusions, and I think you've drawn a wonderful conclusion there. Yeah, emotions and tensions ran high, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know of any incidents that have been documented either through the legend or officially through any kind of records or anything of there being any problems or tensions within the family. Uh, I do know that Mr. John Bell did not particularly like uh, Professor Richard Powell, uh, the schoolmaster. In fact, Powell is said to have even lived in the Bell home for a little while. And it was actually Professor Powell's father, Matthew Powell, who built the Bell home back in 1795, which was uh, nine years before the Bells arrived in the area. Wow. And on that note, we're going to go to break at the top of the hour. We got Pat Fitzhugh for another 30 minutes on Spaced Out Radio. Lots more on the Bell Witch legend coming up on the Mighty SOR. At SpacedOutRadio.com, we have a little bit of everything for you to stay up late. So while you're there, check out our SRR Newswire, where our team brings you stories of the weird and strange to the WTF from around the globe. News on Bigfoot, UFOs, paranormal, Darwinian-type crime tales. It's the stories that the mainstream media usually won't touch. Well, we got them all on the SOR Newswire, only at SpacedOutRadio.com. Come hang out with Spaced Out Radio, where we own the night. This is Carl. You can follow Dave on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and during the show, use the hashtag Spaced Out Radio to chat with us live. On Instagram, at Dave Scott SOR. On Facebook, give our page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. SOR archives are free on YouTube, at Spaced Out Radio. Come join us, or I will come join you. See you at your window. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. 
You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. We are getting ready to relaunch the SOR Space Travelers Club at spacedoutradio.com. For $5 a month, you can join us for a plethora of features found nowhere else. Hang out in a private chat room during the show and after party. You can check out some exclusive content and a store specifically for you, as well as a private listener forum where you can post your thoughts, stories, and pictures. The SOR Space Travelers Club, coming soon to spacedoutradio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. EscapeWatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social media freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social media freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. On the first Tuesday of every month, I encourage you to come along for a journey with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You. Together, we will take a look at how to access the highest expression of yourself and change your life, consciousness, ET contact, health, and wellness. We can talk about it all. So come along for a spiritual ride with me, Geraldine Orozco, on The Spiritual You, only on Spaced Out Radio. 
Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. you like to connect with us head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info now back to dave scott and sor welcome back to the third and final hour of spaced out radio tonight i am your host dave scott always a pleasure to be broadcasting to you this Saturday and Sunday, tomorrow, that is, starting tomorrow, Tessa Nicole Thomas is back with Spaced Out Weekend. We get going at 9 o'clock Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern at SpacedOutRadio.com. Say hello to everyone listening in on the SOR Radio Network and Deep Talk Radio. Remember, all of our archives are free for you at YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club, and it is Zizivas. I don't know. I'm trying that one out because I got the first one wrong. Zizivas is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, soon shop at our store, read up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire, and so much more. For the final time tonight, we introduce Pat Fitzhugh, his website, bellwitch.org. Pat is known as the leading researcher into the legend of the Bell Witch, and we're glad to have him back on Spaced Out Radio tonight. Pat, welcome back to the show. Hey, hey. Looks like we're, we've had so much fun. It's, it's like we just got started, but yet we're like getting into the final hour. I mean, it's I been know, a lot of fun. Been moving quickly, my friend. That's usually what happens around these parts. But nonetheless, the storytelling that you have been telling us in regards to the Bell Witch has been absolutely phenomenal. I do have to ask, before we continue on the legend of it, are people still experiencing any phenomena from this entity? Well, yeah, I get a lot of call uh, emails actually about this, uh, you know, the entity and encounters, uh, you know, there's nothing that's been reported to me that's of the same caliber and intensity of what allegedly happened 200 years ago on the bell farm. But people, you know, nevertheless, you know, they they have situations where they go on to the uh, area, into the area, and sometimes hear their name whispered, or just get a sudden feeling of despair. Um, cars not starting, uh, not being able to take photographs in certain air parts of the area, and then able to in others. Uh, sometimes even some anomalous uh, photographs, you know, that sort of thing mainly, but nothing, you know, nothing like with people getting beat up or anything. Interesting. Do have people seen it? Well, people see strange things occasionally, but, you know, it's not, there's no way of knowing whether that may be the same thing with the Bell Witch Entity or whether it's a case of Paradiola where the mind makes th- makes pat- familiar patterns out of things that they see, or, you know, whether it's just imagination or what, you know, you never know. So getting back to the history with it, uh, you know, in the last half hour, you stated that the family couldn't move. They were, they were pretty much stuck there, and it led to a lot of hard times. When did this start to wrap up? 
did the did it just start to die down on its own or did it continue until the family grew older and started to disperse into their own areas as children left home well where that that came into everything all the, everything seemed to wind down was mr bell's health continued to deteriorate and finally he went into a coma in early december of 1820 and died on the morning of december 20th and after that a lot of the activity died down but kate continued to try and pressure betsy bell into not marrying joshua gardner finally in April of 1821, while Joshua and Betsy were at a community picnic, it is said that the entity, Kate, convinced her, or finally convinced her, to break off her engagement to Joshua Gardner. And as a result, uh, Joshua left, actually went to West Tennessee, and it seemed that most all the activity stopped after that. And then two months later, in June of 1821, Kate made a final appearance in the Bell home and stated that she was going to be gone. Uh, she would return in seven years. And that was it. She was gone. But then fast forward uh, seven years later, sure enough, Kate returns, not with the intensity that she first came with, but just little signs here and there that she was around, a few little noises uh, that were reminiscent of what was heard back in 1817. And then she finally, according to the legend, sat down with John Bell Jr., the second oldest son, who had since moved away from the Bell home and had his own home. And who also, by the way, was the only person in the Bell family who was never scared of Kate and who would always yell at her and call her bluff, sat down with him in 1828 for three nights. The first night, they talked about the past. The second night, they talked about the present. And the third night, they talked about the future. And she bade him farewell, but promised to return to John Bell's most direct descendant in 107 years, which would have made it 1935. So we go forward, fast forward to 1935. And the question is, did Kate ever return? And you hear mixed answers from different people. I mean, some say she returned. Some say she never left the place because of all the weird things that have happened there anyway. So we don't know. But that is the essentially the short version of the Bell Witch. There's a whole lot more to the entire legend from uh, beginning to end. Uh, but what I've told you tonight is the very basic uh, highlighted version of the legend. When you look back at this, what is probably the most prominent part of this entire case? Is it that it only really affected one family? Is it that it took place and really hasn't happened since then? What really sticks out for you? Well, mainly that it has not been solved. Um I mean, it seems like every day or every week somebody's trying to come out with a book or a movie or something, you know, claiming that the Bell Witch has been solved. But, you know, nobody has come forth with any uh, even convincing evidence, much less persuasive evidence. And a lot of the theories that supposedly resolve the legend or solve it are theories that have actually been around for 20 to 30 years, if not longer that have already been disproven long ago, but these people may not know it. So uh, that's the big thing. It's It hasn't been solved, and I don't know that it will ever be solved. 
Uh, and of course, when I say solve, we have to ask the question, solve what? And number two, what constitutes solving it? Solve what means simply explaining what the Bell Witch legend was about, whether it was about a paranormal entity, whether it was a bunch of people experiencing mass hysteria and mass hallucination, whether it was the result of two or more people collaborating to cover something up in the Bell family, or whether somebody was trying to – or you know, recruited some other people to create all these things to f- create problems in the family so that something could happen later on for that person's gain, personal gain. I mean, we don't know. I'd say solving it is having a, a clear understanding of what happened, what really happened as opposed to what stories say happened and why it happened and how it happened. Now, when we ask the question, what do we mean by solved? Well, to me, solved means being able to prove it. If, it's, if it can't be proven, then I don't feel it's solved. Um, at that point, you know, it can be a guess or a theory, but it can't be a fact unless that theory is proven. So... You know, like I said earlier, it would take an awful lot to prove whatever the cause of that was. And, you know, I don't know because of the passage of time that anybody will ever be able to do that. What's on the property now? Okay. The property originally was 228 acres. Then they got the 100 acres. That's 328 acres. The old Bell Farm that property has been sold and subdivided many, many times. Uh, the original tract where the house stood and where the graveyard is, the original family graveyard, and the well is owned by a private foundation, which is, o- which is managed primarily by Bell family descendants, so it's still kept in the family, and it is leased out to farmers to do tobacco farming, things like that. Uh, They will not let anybody in there, Um, mainly, well, several reasons, but one of which has to do with the fact that you can't actually visit those old sites without crossing over somebody's crops. And those farmers make their livings with those crops. So that's an issue there. Plus, there's always the concern, you know, you get a bunch of people in there checking that out. You know, you don't know that all those people are going to be okay. You know, some of the people may vandalize the place or trash the place. So that original tract of land owned by the foundation is pretty much off limits. Now, a lot of the land, other land on the original Bell Farm has you know been subdivided uh some of it is still uh farmland some of it is the woods and there are also a couple of neighborhoods there in the adams area along some of the roads where there are houses now that used to be on the bell farm and also as i mentioned at the beginning of our discussion uh there's the bell witch cave which is a farm as well as um a house uh a barn, a replica of the uh, bell home, the cave, and some other structures, uh, that was part of the original John Bell Farm, too. And last but not least, on the southwest corner of the farm, at the corner of what is now Highway 41 and Keysburg Road, is the Bell Schoolhouse. Not the one that the John Bell children attended, but one that was built in the early 1900s from land gifted from the Bell family to the city of Adams. And that schoolhouse is now used for the Adams Museum, as well as several uh, antique and other shops, and a restaurant. Uh, That's what's there now. So that's essentially what I've told you is essentially what the Bell Farm is today. 
Is the area rife with paranormal investigators traveling there to try and pick up anything? And how does the community respond to that if that is happening? Well, you know, from time to time, I'll hear about somebody wanting to investigate uh, the place. Uh, A lot of times I get emails from people wanting me to get them access to the place to investigate. And, you know, I don't own the place, so I don't have the authority to say who can go there and who can't. Um, But do that to set up their investigations and do all this other stuff that takes me hours and hours of my time, but yet won't even investigate with me or even have me on their shows or anything. So we get a lot of that kind of stuff, and I try to um, deal with that as professionally as I can, so to speak. But, um, you know, as far as actual investigations and who actually investigates the place and who does so legally versus not legally – I really don't know. I mean, it's not that people are necessarily going to tell the world when they do. You know, they may be doing it and, you know, keeping it secret. Um, So I really don't know. I know that there there have been a few of these TV shows come in and use the area as a backdrop or in one case claim to be the only TV show that ever investigated it. Uh, which in reality, two other shows had investigated it about 20 years before. Um, You get a lot of that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, people with paranormal interest, even when they're not investigating, you know, still like to come by and, you know, try to tour the area and see as much as uh, what they can, you know, what they can get to, which isn't much because, like I say, a lot of it is off limits. So how do you go about finding anything new about this project if, you know, the land is now subdivided, it is now a lot of private property, people probably don't want, you know, a bunch of ghost hunters or investigators meddling around their homes. How do you go about it? Is it is it even possible today? Well, there is a fine line between research and investigation, I feel most now let's let's start with investigation. I have been doing paranormal investigation since nineteen seventy eight I'm in my fortieth year, and I've also been researching cases as well. so I've done the paranormal investigation before not only like of the Bellwitch case, but a lot of places all over the United States have done it for a long long time, had a lot of events, had a lot of exciting evidence, and some just really, really crazy and exciting results. But the paranormal investigation, what you're looking for primarily is evidence that cannot be explained by logical means. In other words, you cannot prove the normality or normalcy of something that seems abnormal. 99% of the time you can, but it's that 1% of the time you can't that makes it interesting. You know, something weird happens, we can't prove it, or we get some type of reading on our equipment, we cannot find the source of it after trying to debunk it, which is a paranormal investigator's primary job is to try and debunk everything. So we have something that we can't debunk. Is that necessarily paranormal? No. It just means we can't debunk it. You know, that to me, using that, you know, the equipment and different means to investigate a place, recording, analyzing, and documenting evidence, that's the paranormal side. Ultimately, trying to see whether or not we can prove or suggest that a place may be, a location may be paranormal. Now, on the other side of the coin, we have research. I do research, too. But when I do research, I don't go to the physical location except to take a picture or maybe meet somebody and talk to them. My research is done like interviewing people connected to cases. 
going to courthouses and county archives and pulling up records, taking those records, analyzing them, making notes, noting possibilities, noting the inconsistencies, then going and uh, can't remember if I said it, I'm getting sleepy, uh, interviewing like I say, interviewing people close to the cases. Also going to like county and state archives, um, old uh, church records, anything that has anything to do with the history of the location and the people. Then we go into old news articles. I have to look at news articles. Sometimes those could be on microfiche. Sometimes they show up online, and occasionally you'll find old, actual old copies of old newspapers. You know, all of that is just a massive paper chase. Right. So, in short, my paranormal investigations are done out in the field, and anything that I do in terms of research to try and to get the bottom of a case is done in a library or some other institution with archived official records. One final question for you here, Pat, because we only got about two and a half minutes left with you. The Bell Witch Cave is a famous attraction in the area where they believe this this monster or whatever we want to call it lives. <laughs> I'm I'm curious, how is that being preserved, and have you been there? Okay, well, the story on that is many many years ago. A family owned that property. They were named the Edens family. And the father, the man there, the family, his name was Bill. His nickname was Bims. It so happens that Bims Eden and his wife were really good friends of my uncle on my father's side of the family. And my father knew Bims Eden as well. And there were times when my father and my or my uncle and or my uncle would go up there and spend an afternoon, check on Bims, talk to them for a while, and hang out. And they knew I was interested in the legend. So anytime they would go, they would bring me along. So when I was a little kid, I was all over that place. I would go into the cave many times. Uh, it was like my playground away from home, you know, up until I was probably – maybe 13, 14 years old. Uh, so I was there a lot, way, way back a long time ago. Um, eventually, the Eden family, uh, Bim, Bims Eden died, and the family was sold, or excuse me, the cave and property was sold to new owners. And uh, after they bought it, I had I think I went to the cave maybe three or four times all the way up until I think the last time I actually went there on that property was about 19, 1999 uh, was the last time I was there. But like I say, you know, those few times plus all the other times I was there when I was much younger under the other owners, you know, I've been there plenty of times. Uh, have I had any strange encounters in there? Me personally, no. But I was in there on tours with people who did, and I know of one case where a guy told me he was standing there, and all all of a sudden he felt there was like somebody stabbing him in the ear. Oh my goodness! With a piece of ice. Ouch! That's not very good. And, and we walked out of the cave, and this was a very hot summer day. It was up into the nineties. And he's like, here, if you don't believe me, here, put your hand on my ear. And I did. And sure enough, there was a note, only a tiny spot on his ear was ice cold. I thought on that, that was pretty On that note, my friend, we got to say goodnight to you. We got the news coming up next on Spaced Out Radio. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio Live with Dave Scott on the Deep Talk Radio Network.
Hi there, this is Geraldine Orozco from San Francisco's Bay Area Meditation. I invite you to join me the first Tuesday of every month with Dave Scott for Spaced Out Radio's The Spiritual You. In this fast-paced world we live in, it's time for you to take some time for you. We'll cover every possible subject from powerful meditation to healing techniques to your own intuition and spirituality. So come join us for The Spiritual You. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Did you know Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi there, this is Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm here to take you on a paranormal journey each Saturday and Sunday night. Why change the station when you have it all right here? Together, we'll hang out and share some strange and scary stories. And don't forget, we have Psychic Sundays as well, so come tune in Spaced Out Weekend. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com, where we own the night. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger, and Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. 
Heading to Vancouver and looking for a night on the town? The Moose Vancouver is the bar that never stops rocking until 2 a.m. every night. The Moose has great food with everything on the menu from $6.95 to $8.95. Fantastic, vibrant staff and rock and roll that will bring you back to when the music was real, the hair was long, and the guitars were rocking. Get your party on at the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Coming soon to our website, spacedoutradio.com, is the SOR Space Travelers Club. For just five bucks a month, you can get into a private area on our site where you can hang with other listeners in our chat room, post in our forum, and check out a bunch of exclusive content and store that won't be found anywhere else, including a nightly after show party with Dave. It's going to be the best $5 a month you're going to spend. The SOR Space Travelers, only at spacedoutradio.com. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an Escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized Escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. We've rounded third. We are heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Big thank you to Pat Fitzhugh coming on to talk about the legend of the Bell Witch. Of course, you can get the archives for this one at Spaced Out Radio's YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio about 10, 15 minutes after the show, and it will be there for you. We got the news coming up. No Olaf Phillips tonight. We gave him the night off to go do some manly prowling. Because that's what single guys do. So you got me reading the news. The SOR Newswire right now. The news is always changing, which is why we bring you the SOR Newswire, provided by Captain Shirk at SpacedOutRadio.com. And if Olive's here, we also want to give him a shout-out, say, hey, buddy, how you doing? Hope you're having a great night. He's with Paranoia Magazine at ParanoiaMagazine.com. But with the SOR Newswire, you can check it out on our website. Go to the news section. Just click on it. It's all right there. As well, you can give our Facebook page a like. Just go to facebook.com forward slash SOR News Wire. So, we got some interesting stories tonight. Some that'll make you scratch your head. I want to know what you would do about this. All right? So, in East Rutherford, New Jersey, there was a car accident. Two crashes. And one of them involved an armored vehicle. And on the busy stretch of highway on Route 17, near or Route 3 West, near Route 17, as the collision happened, door flies open to the Brinks armored truck and spills $100 bills all over the freeway. Apparently, now police were having to do an audit to determine how much money was actually lost because people were grabbing the money, jumping out of their vehicle, saying, hey, I, I could use a couple of bucks here. They're not looking to charge anybody, but they want the money back. As if it's Christmas time. People are, you know, I mean, it's not right to steal. That's exactly what happened, is people stole the money. 
But at Christmas time where people are working hard and they see, you know, Santa's money sleigh get in a car accident, why not stop and grab a couple of bucks? Right? Nothing wrong with a couple of Benjamins. They're still trying to figure out how much money was actually stolen from this. But would you do that? Would you jump out of your vehicle, grab a, a few bills, or, or would you try and help be a good citizen and, and try and help clean that up? There is a big-time moral dilemma at that point, you know, because maybe, just maybe, somebody who took that money was on their, you know, maybe near empty on their gas, and they were wondering how the heck they were going to go to work, and maybe this was their, their little bit of a blessing in disguise. Either way, they stole the money, but... I mean, the way that it was blowing around on the freeway, who knows? Maybe there's still a few hundred dollars out there. But would you give the money back or would you keep it? Moral dilemma at Christmas time. Because wallets are tight these days. They have been for a few years. Money isn't growing on trees the way it did before the economic collapse in 2008. I don't think we've ever really recovered from that. But it does make you wonder. The good news is there was no injuries in the accident, except for the loss of a number of $100 bills. I'm curious. Tweet it to me at at, at Spaced Out Radio. Would you take the money or would you give it back? Very, very curious to find out indeed. You can also Facebook me on that as well. I'm still wondering, what would I do? I think I would try and help clean it up because... You know, morally, it's not mine. But then again, I can understand somebody pocketing a couple of bills. What would you do? Let's move on, shall we? What would you do if you found this? Minor, miners, pardon me, in the far reaches of the Canadian North have found a rough 552-carat yellow diamond, considered the largest diamond in the world of its size. Seventh largest ever found. Pardon me, so it's not the largest. It's about the size of a chicken's egg, discovered in October in the Northwest Territories in Diavik, about 135 miles south of the Arctic Circle. So this is what happened. They're going into this mine in Diavik, and, and, you know, they're thinking this thing could be about 2 billion years old. And it's estimated to be around a couple million dollars for this diamond. You know, somewhere, somehow, somebody in New York is going to be wearing this on their finger, right? But it does have some rough abrasions on it. Ooh. Shane Bergen from the Dominion, uh, CEO of Dominion, told Bloomberg Magazine, very hard to give a ballpark estimate on its value. It all depends on, once again, the cutting and the result of the stone ending up. But either way, when it's that big, you, you know you're looking at a multi-million dollar piece. And you know, these these diamond mines up there... When I used to work in financing, I had a client who worked in one of the diamond mines up there. And literally, they have to, it's pretty strict what they have to do. They literally have to, when they go into the mine, because you're in camp for a couple of months, and then you get a few weeks off. But each and every time they go into the mine, armed guards armed with AR-15s and shotguns, high-powered shotguns, send you through a security check. And each time you go into the mine, you're, you have a full body search, including a cavity search. And when you come out, the exact same thing, because they are so afraid of employees trying to steal these diamonds. The closest diamond to this, by the way, was a 36.80 carat diamond recently sold at Christie's auction house for $1.3 million. So this being a 552 carat before it's cut, you can expect this will probably fetch 
in the $2 million range. But what a find. What a find. It's actually quite gorgeous. Have you heard this one about the gentleman in Vermont? Got so fed up with his community and his town development review board for denying his building permit request to construct an 8,000 square foot garage on his home that he has actually, after 10 years of trying to build the garage and getting denied, decided to do something about it. So on his property, he erected a 700 pound wooden sculpture of a middle finger being pointed at the town. And there is nothing that the law can do about it. The gentleman, his name is Ted Pelkey. (laughs) He laughs about it, but he says, I'm not trying to cause hate and animosity to the people who live in the town because there's very good people in the town. But he didn't know how else to get his point across. He spent $4,000 to have the wooden hand with the middle finger flipped up. Created. It is sitting on top of a 16-foot pole. Now, it can be seen driving through town along the highways. But there's nothing they can do about it because it's out of jurisdiction. It isn't considered a form of advertising because there's no advertising on it. According to the state's transportation agency, they also go on and say that although the structure is visible from a state highway, it is out of the state right away and not within the jurisdiction. So literally, the town can't bring it down. And the transportation agency cannot bring it down either. So here's this giant middle finger sitting pointed towards the community. Somehow, I don't think that's the way to get your garage built. I understand the frustration. I understand that you have gone through the process and for a decade you've been declined. I understand that you're pissed off. But erecting a 16-foot pole with a giant middle finger pointing up, how do you explain that to kids? And I, and I think these people who do these ludicrous things, they don't think of the... Ch- of the children. You know what I'm saying? They don't think of, of how you got to explain this to a child who says, what is that? Or tries to imitate it. There's not much thinking there. I'm not a fan of it. I understand the protest. I get the protest. I'm all for public protest. It's, you know, a great freedom to have. But at some point, you also got to be smart about it instead of erecting a giant middle finger that could be seen for miles. It's ridiculous. Pelkey thinks that they're biased against him. Well, you're not doing yourself any good to the cause now. I don't know. I don't know. We got time for one more here before we get to the thought of the day. And what would a night be around here without a high-quality story out of Florida. So, things recently in Monroe County, Florida, got a little out of hand at an Islam Islamorada workplace. Police had to be dispatched to a call for disturbance at a wood shop. So they meet up with this lady named Sharon Milton. Said she had been attacked by a fellow staffer who had been causing issues at work, such as cordoning off her area and blocking other people's paths. She went on and tried to retrieve a dustpan where the suspect, Teresa Denise Richards, was working, but that Richard had blocked off her area with a chop saw. Milton asked the tool to be removed. And, well, here we go. The middle finger was given. And here starts the argument. The brawl starts. Tried to physically remove the chop saw to gain access to the dustpan. But, I mean, this is right out of... I mean, could you imagine Jim Ross from WWE calling this? We got a slobber knocker of a match here over a dustpan. 
even picked up a hammer and started swinging it at Milton. This is Ms. Richards. What is this? This is crazy. Milton finally pinned Richards to the ground until a male co-worker removed the hammer from her grip and let, and then she let Richards go. That's when Richards then picked up a two foot long wooden stick and tried to hit Milton successfully a few times. The male co-worker then disarmed Richards again and then went at her with potentially, they're not sure, but they think it was a screwdriver. Yeah. Richards was arrested, aggravated assault without intention to kill, and aggravated battery with a deadly weapon. She's uh, now out being held on bail for thirty grand. This is just awesome. I'm really starting to love Florida. Florida, you amaze me. You make me feel so good every night. Every night. I don't know what it is about your state, but I think I really want to visit there. I really, really think I do. On that note, let's get to the thought of the day. Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we post a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, Twitter pages, that is, and then we take your responses and read them over the air. Why? Well, we love the audience participation around here. And we got a cool little topic tonight for all of you. Today's thought of the day is, what's a paranormal supernatural legend in your area? See, around here, it would be, remember you heard me earlier talking to Pat Fitzhugh in the first hour about, about Agnes McVie. Big, big legend here. Big, big legend. Did she really kill 60-plus men, stealing their gold on the Gold Rush Trail? Or is it just a legend? Big debate in my town about that. But wasn't really supernatural, paranormal, even though they still say her ghost walks in the mu- museum where I do the tour. We've never ran into Agnes there, though. So we're going to kick this thing off. The Charman. Beware of the Charman of OJ, California. That's from Stefan. Trixie says, Third Bridge. This is a legend that stems from the true story of Sand Creek Massacre. Not too far from where I live, you can reach an area only known as Third Bridge, taking you far into the southeast. Once you make it to the Third Bridge, you are in the area. Here you can hear the beat of native drums with a lot of... What a lot of people do not realize, though, is that there are two Third Bridge locations. Now, a couple, uh, both Stefan and Trixie posted, like, YouTube stories on this. Don't have time for that. I apologize. I do not. That's why I asked for your rec- uh, your recommendation, your writing on it. Robert says it's the Bennington Triangle. It's in David Politis' four one missing four one one books. Strange disappearances in the woods without any explanation. People say the area is filled with bad energy. It's in the New England area. It's been uh, popularized in two books, including Shadow Child. This actually looks like a cool story. This is why I love doing these thoughts of the Daves because they actually give us some information on what we could actually look for for different show topics on this show. I'm going to look that one up. That one sounds kind of cool. Kelly. Well, I could say skunk ape, skunk ape. It's a Florida thing. However, I'm going with Florida man. He is everywhere in Florida all at once, always causing shenanigans and tomfoolery and keeping Dave entertained on a nightly basis. You can't forget Florida woman on that, Kelly. You cannot. No, sir. Your beard was missing out on one right there. Roger. A witch buried with cement on top of the grave in a cemetery. That's going to a little bit of extreme. 
making sure that the witch doesn't get out of her grave. Andy, my favorite one is the Hearts Bridge Ghost. Now, I was always told a man died impaled on rebar working on this tiny bridge, and this was the ghost you would see at night. Boy Scouts used to have a tradition of going there late at night and dropping off a group of kids on one end and making them walk across the bridge back towards the car at the other. The ghost has since changed to a woman in a gown coming out only when you blink your lights at night. There are, of course, no end to the Civil War ghost stories here. There was an old house behind our utility company that has been converted into a care center and it had been a slave quarter un- or it had a slave quarter under it and lends to a number of weird encounters and cur- occurrences as well. Jonathan says in Connecticut, Dudley Town in California it has to be the Queen Mary. Matt, Fairfield Hills Insane Asylum Egypt Valley for Grant. Sean says there's a few within 30 miles of me, the Ohio State Reformatory, Screaming Mimi Bridge in Old Fort, Ohio, and Holcomb Woods Road in Bowling Green. Jade, one of the biggest would be the Oak Island mystery regarding the treasure. You've all heard about Oak Island, haven't you? Yes, we have. Reverend Keith, a couple years ago, there was a 100-year sighting of the Cubs winning the World Series. Yeah. That's still unbelievable. Heather gets the final word tonight. She goes, I'm from Massachusetts. So much paranormal stuff out that way. The Bridgewater Triangle. We have the Lizzie Borden House and the Dover Demon. That's just to name some of the popular ones. And we want to say a big thank you to all of you for participating in the Thought of the Dave this week. Big thank you to Pat Fitzhugh for coming on the show talking about the Bell Witch really enjoyed that hopefully by monday when i am back my voice will be back as well but until then saturday and sunday night we got spaced out weekend with the beautiful lovely and talented tessa nicole thomas she gets going at spacedoutradio.com 9 p.m pacific midnight eastern we got mr ron bumblefoot thaw rocking in the background with little brother is watching Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Big thank you to everybody this week listening in in the chat rooms, taking part in the fun. On Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio, your snark was lovely. Just lovely. Even you, Snickers. And, of course, everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be, thanks for a great week. Thanks for helping us get bigger and better every single night. Because together, my friends, we own the night. I will talk to you on Monday. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a great weekend, everybody. Good night.